I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the epic feature film that came out in 2005 by Veggie Tales entitled Lord of the Beans. How many of you are familiar with Lord of the Beans? You watched it, you've seen it. A very good number of you. You can tell who had kids in that time and who didn't. There's that. Um, so Lord of the Beans became a favorite at our house. Danny was a year old when it came out, so Catherine was three. So, uh, of course, we got it right away, as we did all the other Benny Tales things, and started watching it, and I absolutely loved it. And I was laughing. And the kids are laughing kind of at the movie, but they think it's a little weird, but they keep watching it, and they start quoting it, and they get to know it. But obviously, at one and three years old, and even two and five and three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I did not have them ever watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy. <laughs> Mom's laughing like you better not have. Now we we just no. differ with that. Right? <laughs> My I had college kids when he was. Yeah. So watched it. You see, when you got older kids, in here, we didn't have it. She was saying Andrew saw it at like three, four years old. And some kids are different than ours. I knew that if I showed my son the Lord of the Rings movie before he was about 16, he would be terrified by the ring rapes and everything else going on. So he loved the Lord of the Rings, but he had no idea of the actual story that it was patterned after, right? So he knew the character Randolph, but he didn't know anything about Gandalf. And he knew of this animated veggie tale saying that they had Bill Boy baggy pants without ever knowing anything about Bill Boy baggy pants, much less him. You know, Toto baggy pants, his Frodo baggy and all these things that, you know, Ranger Iricorn, and you got the elf Legolam, and the, the grumpy dwarf played by Paul Gray, without any, any idea that these were playing off of and patterned after this other great epic tale by J.R.R. Tolkien, and then the movies by Peter Jackson. And I love that the creators of Veggie Tales even have the Umbrella Boy in there. Oh, I've got the new Umbrella. You're like, oh, that's so strange. Do you even know what that is? Well, because in the books, there's Tom Bombadil, right? And he's out there in the forest, and he's got this booming voice, and he's able to speak against the, the Barrow Whites, and you're like, what are those? None of that made the Peter Jackson films. None of that was in the trilogy. That most people, but if you've read the stories, at least, oh, that's Tom Bombadil, and they've got this Umbrella Boy. That's phenomenal. And, and yet, my kids wouldn't have the foggiest clue about any of that. Even people who've seen the movie have no idea, why is this umbrella boy in the Benjamin's those things singing about his new umbrella to whom? Because Tom Bombadil is this other character in the books, and Peter Jackson thought he was irrelevant to the storyline, so we left him out of the movies. There are stories that we just assume that we know. But there are stories that we've become familiar with, and we grow so familiar with them, We've kind of forgotten the actual story. And that can happen in a lot of different ways in life. And I recognize this week that maybe Jonah is one of those stories. That we know the story of Jonah so well that maybe we don't know the story of Jonah. And so one of the things I wanted to do this morning is for us to read through the story of Jonah. That's right, the whole book. Uh, it's only four chapters, and they're short chapters. So I did this a couple times this week and time myself, and it takes me about seven and a half minutes to get through reading the story of Jonah out loud. And I thought, well, it might be worthwhile, first and foremost, because it is the Word of God, and it's the thing that has inspired power, and anything else I say is just simply uninspired commentary. So it's, it's good for us to give attention to the public reading of Scripture but also for us to read the story as a whole, and for us to be reminded of the things that go on in the story of Jonah, a story we might all say, oh, I know it, I know it so well. But let's read it again this morning. So I'm gonna start in Jonah 1, and we're gonna read through the story of Jonah. I have a New American Standard Bible, because 30 years ago in Bible school, that's what they used, that's what I got familiar with. Yours might be slightly different. I grew up in those King James only kind of independent fundamentalist Baptist churches, so I'm happy to have a, a New American Standard. Maybe you have something else. So don't worry if the words are a little bit different here and there, but we're just going to read through the story that we all know so well and be reminded of what God revealed to us in the story of Jonah. 
I will try to keep my commentary to a minimum. That was my problem as I read it even out loud during the week. I kept wanting to interject certain thoughts and explanations like we'll, we'll just try to go through it and, and, and then I can explain some other things if I feel like I need to. Okay. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to light it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Get up! Call on your God! Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. And each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots, we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? From what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. So they said to him, What should we do that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know on account of me this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to the land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stronger against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not put innocent blood on us, for thou, O Lord, hast done as thou hast pleased. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. And then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. Thou didst hear my voice, for thou hast cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All thy breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I've been expelled from thy sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward thy holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head, and I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But thou hast brought me up, my life from the pit, the Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to thee, into thy holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days' walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. And he issued a proclamation which said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat and drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly 
that each may turn from his wicked ways and from the violence which is in his hand. Who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so we shall not perish. And when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked ways, then God relented concerning the calamity which he declared would bring upon them. And he did not do it. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better than life. And the Lord said, Do you have good reason to be angry? And Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it, and there he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade till he could see what would happen to the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head, delivering from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when the dawn came the next day. It attacked the plant, and it withered. And it came about when the sun came up that God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, so he became faint. And he begged with all of his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. And God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry about a plant? And Jonah said, I have a good reason to be angry, even to death. And the Lord said, You had compassion on a plant for which you did not work which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? It's one of the most amazing stories in the Bible. It's the only of the minor prophets that just reads as a story. It just reads as narrative. In fact, it's the only of any of the prophets that just simply reads as narrative. We don't have long recordings of oracles and speeches. We don't have visions and interpretations. We just have the story of Jonah. As we look at it today, one of the things that has come back to this story is when something that's been gnawing at me and say, what, what is it that... Not that we've missed or that we've never seen before, but God, what is it that you want us to hear from the story of Jonah now? What is it that we need to know, that we need to hear from the story of Jonah? And one of the things that I've come to and looked at, and as I think of life in the church, and most of you have experienced a lifetime in churches, who are the kind of servants that God uses? Who are the people that God uses? uses. In this story, we have Jonah as the simple character. I mean, why would God use somebody like Jonah? What is it that we would say Jonah is like? And so as we look at who are the kind of people that God uses, here's what I've seen are kind of the possibilities in, in Jonah has, has shown us. There's, there, there's four different kinds of servants you can have, four different kinds of, of ministers, four different kinds of prophets and teachers that we see throughout Scripture. And the one in the upper left, and you kind of see where the truth combines with character. And so on the left, we've got character from good to bad. At the top, we've got truth, and its opposite would not just be error, but lies. So the kind of minister that we could have, the one that we want to have, the one that we see in, in a Daniel, and the one we see in Isaiah, and some others is a servant who knows the truth and has good character. One who's obedient to God, one who's dedicated to God. Even in their confusion, like Habakkuk, even in their wondering, they still stand before God and say, I will humble myself, I will live by faith in God, even though I don't understand. I will proclaim this truth, even though I don't like it. But we've also got servants in Scripture, and even the one we left, a servant who knows the truth, but has poor character. And we're going to see in just a moment, that's where Jonah's going to fall. He's a prophet of God. He is used by God. He's directed by God. But he does not demonstrate the character of God. We've got a lot of other prophets in the Old Testament. 
on this side. Some who are servants who know the truth, or excuse me, servants who do not know the truth, but they have good character. Upstanding people. I and mean, they have good character in the sense of what our world would call good character. They're, they're, they're good, they're, they're kind, they're moral. The old priest Eli might be one that we put here. He seemed like a good man. He, he mostly cared for people, but the truth just wasn't in him. And the way he raised his sons, the way he left, they were just perverting God's truth there at the temple. And so he dies. And his children die as punishment for him because he didn't know the truth, even though he seemed like a good man. And then, even the scriptures are full of people in this fourth category. Servants, prophets, priests who do not know the truth, and they have bad character. God's going to talk to some of these and some of the other minor prophets. We're going to see Malachi talk to the priests, and, and God will say to the priest, shut the gate to the temple. None of you knows me. None of you is declaring the truth. None of you is and you're doing evil. You're doing horrible things. And they'll say, what are we doing that's wrong? They can't even see it. They don't even recognize. They have bad character and they've departed from the truth. The New Testament is full of some of these pictures. I mean, the New Testament talks about false teachers and those who come in even to the church. And Paul will talk at length in Titus, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and several other books about those who may come into the church and they're devious, they're deceptive. They desire to draw people away, or they're filled with a desire for the love of money, and they don't know the truth. Oh my goodness, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, those small books are all about discerning truth from lies in the church. And he reminds and points out and names names of those who are liars and they're of corrupt character, even though they've taken leadership in a New Testament church. Even though they're establishing ministries in a New Testament church. They're full of lies and they're of bad character. What about people who are full of lies and have good character? Uh, I've lived in Independence, Missouri for the last 20 plus years. You know, it's the headquarters of the reorganized Latter-day Saints. But there's an entire denomination, I would call it a cult, that's full of lies, that does not know Jesus as the eternal God, the Son of God, who, who cannot lead you to salvation because they don't declare the truth about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And there are cults all over our world with some of the nicest people. You like to have them as your neighbors. I mean, they maintain their lawns and their houses, and they're these big families, and they're helpful, and they're kind, and generous, and caring, and gracious, and they've got great character. But they do not know the truth. And then, yes, even in the New Testament, we see some who are servants who know the truth, but they have poor character. We did a whole study in Philippians, right? Remember what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1? There are some who are preaching the gospel out of strife and envy, desiring to do me harm. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have the truth, but the way they're doing it, and even their purpose in doing it, is to, is to cause Paul more problems. It's to embarrass Paul, to point out that he's not the one you should look, he's in prison, he's in jail. We're not. We're free on the streets of Rome. And Paul says they're preaching the gospel out of strife and envy. And you know what he says about it? Hey, the gospel is being preached. Some are doing it out of love. Some are doing it out of strife. But at least the truth is being proclaimed. I look at this. And I look at Jonah and go, how could God use people of that character? And I don't just mean people who, you know, they're not perfect, they do make some. I mean, how could God use someone like Jonah, who just through the whole of the book, he's just corrupt in his character? And how can you say, well, let's look at Jonah. Let's look at what kind of servant he was, just from the text of Jonah itself. So we go back to chapter 1, verse 3, it doesn't take us long to establish what he's like. 
the word of the Lord comes to him. He says, go to Nineveh in verse 3. But he rises up to flee from the presence of the Lord. He's trying to run away from God. And then when he does, he goes on a ship, which pretty quickly seems to come into storms and a rough sea that gets worse and worse. And running up three times, did you notice? But they kept getting worse. And everything they tried to do, and they kept getting worse. And it's this epic story, this great picture. And what's going on? They're grabbing the, the rest of the crew, verses 4 or 5, they're grabbing everything from the cargo hold to lighten the ship. And what else is in the cargo hold? Jonah. Sleeping. Side note, wrestling with God is really tiring. Fighting against God can be really, really tiring. Been there, done that. Don't want to go through it again. Probably will in my obstinance. Wrestling against God, fighting God can wear you out. So the one thing they should grab from the cargo hold and throw it over, they haven't done yet. But then look, the captain comes in verse 6 and says, how is it that you're just laying here? Look what the rest of us are doing. And you just, you don't care. He doesn't care about everybody else on board the ship. And then, once he's awake and once he's active, come let us cast lots to find out who's responsible. Can you picture it? Jonah's just there like, yeah, okay. cast lots, maybe it will fall on somebody else, because surely some of these guys are more wicked than I am. I mean, just look at it. I've heard some of the stories. He's been on the ship a little while, and I've heard what they're doing. He's letting them cast thoughts, hoping that it'll fall on somebody else, hoping that he won't be pointed out. The prophet of God, and the whole lots thing he casting off stone is, I don't know, I don't understand it. The Urim and Thummim in the Old Testament, even when the priest tool with the little magic stuff, I, I don't know. Our God's a mysterious God, and I am plenty okay not knowing a lot of things. The, the older I get, the less I think I know and really understand. So, how did they cast lots? How did it work? How did it fall on Jonah? Don't know. But he's standing there watching it happen, hoping it's like, he's not taking responsibility. He's not fessing up. He knows that it's him. He knows that he is directly responsible. He's endangering everybody else on the ship. But he doesn't care. And he doesn't admit it until he's cornered. So then when they finally do come to him and say, who are you? What's your occupation? What's going on? From what people are you? Look at verse 10. They're like, how could you do this? Because he told them what he was doing. Finally. Finally, they're crying out to all their gods. We talk about these Phoenician ships, and we found altars to other gods and all kinds of... I mean, they're not spiritual people. They just don't know the truth. Here's Jonah, who knows the truth. There's a corrupt character. He's not fessing up. He's not until he's absolutely cornered, has nothing left to do. He says, well, okay, I'll explain. See, I serve the one true God, the one who made this sea in the dry land. But I'm running from him. I'm disobeying him. I'm living in this obedience. And so he's after. Really? We had to get to this point before you fessed up? And then they finally throw him overboard. And they're fine. But he endangered everybody else on that ship. And you know when sin comes into the church? It endangers everybody on the ship. But we go on. Jonah finally picks up, goes to the I don't know how much I can make of this first word in chapter 2, verse 1, because I, I, we're not able to determine from the Hebrew specifically whether this is a temporal adverb or Last verse of chapter 1, Jonah's in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Then he prayed. Folks, just like you saw Lord of the Rings when you were young, Andrew, I had older brothers and sisters. I saw Jaws when I was about seven years old. <laughs> to this day, I am scared to death of being eaten by a shark. Or worse, being bit by one and made one. The times I've tried to do better in my life, be a little healthier, and I'm there again, I, I, I go to the gym and I swim. And 
Four days this last week, I've gone to the gym, I've gotten in the pool. You know there's still once in a while I put the guys and I check to make sure there's not a shark in the pool. <laughs> Must be a that or a clown. I mean, either would just scare me to death because I saw it when I was there. So, shark scare. If I'm at the edge of a ship, I'm worried about sharks. If I fall off a boat or a ship, the first thing I'm going to do is cry out in horror for God to save me. Jonah is in a fish for three days and three nights. <sighs> then he cries out to God. Wow. Wow. Okay, it took that. All right, we're finding out about his character. Then he gets up and he goes to Nineveh. And what's his message to Nineveh? Repent for the Lord. No. No. Look at his message in verse 4. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. But here's how you can know God, because he has a plan for your life and four simple spiritual. No. You're all going to die in 40 days. Now, we, we can't make too much of an argument from silence, I understand. But there's no record of Jodah calling the people to repent and turn from their ways. He just condemns them. They decide, verse 8, that each should earnestly call on God and that they should turn from their wicked ways and that they should turn from their violence. We talked about last week what a horrible, <coughs> violent people they were. And they decide to repent and to turn to God, hoping, verse 9, who knows? God might turn and repent. Who knows? Because Jonah didn't tell us, if you turn and repent, God will have mercy on you. They got to say, who knows that God might? At least we understand God's, and we understand we're rich enough to know that the gods are angry, we're going to change our ways, and we're going to repent, and we hope that this God was it. But they just have to hope, who knows, because Jonah didn't tell them more about his God. We don't get the idea that Jonah's starting Bible studies in small groups during this 40 days, and you know, spreading this word of hope and new life and transformation. We don't get any of that. 40 days and judgment is coming, and he's upset that they turn. He hoped to prevent God's rescue plan for Nineveh. You understand? When you have a servant of God who hopes God is not merciful, who hopes God is not gracious, who hopes God does not forgive sin, he hoped to at least forestall their deliverance as long as possible. He says so in his own words, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He hoped to see his enemies utterly destroyed, even after they turn, after they repent. He goes outside the city, verse 5, sits up on a hill with the implication that he's waiting to see it destroyed. He's hoping to see fire fall from heaven, something like Sodom and Gomorrah, destroy them, wipe them out. And he would rather die. He would rather die than see people converted. He would rather die and see God be gracious towards those he considers to be enemies. And then the book ends with him being angry at God. Angry because God is compassionate. That's his character. So I, I don't know what else I could say about Jonah except that he knows the truth but has bad character would fall into that area where we'd say he's a servant who knows the truth but has poor character. But then, what do we see of God in this story? The God who is. So there we've, we've seen the prophet, what kind of servant Jonah was. Now we see the God who is. The God who is. That God still used Jonah. That Jonah was useful even in his disobedience. Think about this: that even at his worst, he saved a whole boatload of sailors. I mean, literally, a whole boatload of sailors, rough guys of the sea, who, who it says in, in the end of chapter one, they call on the Lord, they earnestly call on the Lord, even after they've been saved and the sea has stopped its raging, they fear the Lord greatly, they honor, they revere, they respect. They offer sacrifices to the Lord. They make vows to the one true God of Israel. 
They demonstrated faithfulness. No repentance in a character, too. And I believe that this represents that even at his worst, God still used Jonah to save the ship full of sailors. And in Jonah's begrudging, minimal obedience, doing, it seems like, the, the, the most minimal he could to go to Nineveh to say just these few words, condemnation, and yet God uses him to save an entire empire. That an empire comes to know God. When Jonah is just minimally obedient. And, and, and we can look at and could take the time to look at the actual history of Assyria. And we know that there is this period in the middle of the 700s, it, it seems to be about a decade long, where this pagan, heathen, polytheistic nation suddenly becomes monotheistic for about a 10 year period. That for whatever reason, not Asher Bam Paul, but the one before it, uh, Asher Prusite. Hard to pronounce. But there's this period in the Assyrian history where they turn to one God. And it's kind of inexplicable. The other historians, this story seems to fit that they actually changed. They actually repented. And the empire is changed for a while. Now, they'll go back in some years, they'll go back. And not when other prophets will go and condemn them further, and, and there will be future judgment. And, but just like in Israel's life, there are times where they're under God's wrath and condemnation, but in times where they repent, and times where they're obedient. So God is gracious and merciful to Jonah. I think because even in his failures, Jonah knew God. Jonah had a relationship with God. But being here is not the goal. It's not what God wants to see in his servants. So who are the servants that God uses? Well, it seems like, through the Jonah example, God can use anyone who knows the truth, anyone who knows him, anyone who's in relationship with him, who knows the truth of the one God who is, that God can use them. Those who don't know truth, those who only know error, it doesn't matter how good they are. It doesn't matter how nice they are. If they don't know the one true God and they can't proclaim his message of truth, they're not usable. They're not worth listening to. But it amazes me that on this side, God even uses ministers of poor character. Have you been under the ministry of someone like that? Is there a time in your past when you were a church like that? And maybe it was the pastor, maybe it was a group of deacons, maybe it was just a group of leaders in the church. It turned out it had really bad character and they hurt people. Man, we're looking we're facing challenges in the church today of ministers who aren't faithful. Ministers who we find out don't have good character. And sometimes we go, how what, what does that mean about the ministry? I mean, on the national scale, we have someone like Robbie Zacharias who had what seemed like this most amazing incredible ministry for decades, a man full of truth and wisdom, but we find out near the end and then after he passes that he had corrupt character, sexually immoral, not just accusations, but now the family and the ministry admitting that he didn't have proper safeguards, this man abused people, he abused his power, he abused his money, his position, that he had poor character. And I got Students I know at the seminary who said, man, I love this. This guy brought me to the Lord. It was his books, his teaching that set my mind on seminary. He, he changed me. And now, now I find out that he was just a fraud. And it's like, well, we just found out actually that he had poor character. He knew the truth. And, and the ministry that he did, God still used him. It wasn't what God desired. It wasn't the way God wanted ministers to. I mean, when Paul talks in Philippians 1 about God still uses those who preach the gospel out of strife and envy and jealousy. I know pastors who their goal is to climb that ladder denominationally. And man, they'll use any church to get there. They, they see churches and people as stepping stones. They see relationships as something to be used and manipulated and to advance and to get to that next level. It's the, the politics and denominations of churches. It's just disgusting. You've seen it? 
maybe been affected by it. That's not what God desires. But God is gracious enough to them to even use them. Well, what do we do with that? Well, what should be the goal for us? What should we desire? There are several in this room who are in occupational ministry. There are several whose lives are about ministering and evangelizing and, and caring for others. What is the goal here? It's to be people of truth, but also good character. That's the plan. That's what God desires for us. That's how he wants us to be as ministers. Truth and good character. To be holy. To be set apart for the service of God. As we look at that, we go, how? <laughs> how do we be holy? If the goal is holiness, and holiness should be the goal for those of us who know the truth, for all of us. If your ministry is to the little ones in the nursery downstairs, this is the goal. Holiness. If your ministry is to the kids in Sunday school, or the youth here on Sunday night, or, or you're in charge of a greater ministry somewhere, the goal is holiness. Be holy as I am holy, God declares. Wow. I mean, it's, isn't there something between really bad character and perfect holiness? Well, that's the goal. That's what we aspire to. That's what God desires for us to aspire to. So how? Well, here's this thing that we'll see throughout the scriptures. The, the technical way I talk about it down the street is the indicative precedes the imperative. The indicative precedes imperative. The imperative is what it tells you to do. The indicative is what you are. So here's what we see throughout the New Testament. Be who you are. Be who you are. Not the way our culture says it out there. Oh, just be whoever you are. Just be whatever you feel. Be whatever. No, no, no. You need to understand who you are. And who are you? Who has God made you? This is just a small sampling of the things that we could look at. First one, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. I sent the wrong verse in my notes. And in, in, in the notes and in what's in the bulletin said 2 Peter 2, 9 and 10. And if you got one from the table before I corrected it, please correct it now. Because 2 Peter... 2, 9, and 10 is not the verse we want to read right now. 1 Peter 2, 9, and 10 is what we're looking for. I took a pen and corrected many of them that were out there. So what, is, what does God say to us in 1 Peter 2, 9, and 10? You are a chosen race. You, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if the Holy Spirit dwells and inhabits you, you are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people for God's own possession. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Past tense, he has done that. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. So this is not just for the Jewish people any longer. Peter's declaring now that all of us who are in Christ, even those who were formerly far away, us Gentiles, those of us who did not know the mercy of God, who did not know the oracles of God, the things of God, now through Christ we have been brought near, in fact brought into the family. You are holy. You are chosen. You are a priesthood. You are the people of God's own possession. And what God is calling you to is not to become that, but to simply say, now be who you are. This is who he's already made you to be. This is what he's already done in you. Revelation 1, 5, and 6. We're not going to turn to that right now, but I've given you many of these to read during the week. You have been made kingdom priests. A kingdom of people who are priests, who, who have intercession before God. You already are that. This is not something you have to aspire to be or to become somehow, to get some level of Christianity. This is who you are. This is who he's made you. On that day that you were saved, set apart, sanctified, sealed, regenerated, indwelled, baptized in the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16 reminds us you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. We don't have time to look at all of these, but we know a lot more than we can do just in this time, so you can look during the week. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know your body is 
a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You're not your own anymore. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, be who you are. <laughs> Therefore, glorify God in your body. Be who he has already made you to be. Live out and experience what you already are positionally. Be who you are. We're not trying to become these things. It's not incumbent on us to hope to achieve these things. God calls us to be who we already are, who he's made us. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 says he has chosen you already to be holy and blameless. He's already done it. Colossians 1.22, you've been reconciled. The relationship has already been restored so that you can be holy. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. Look at that one. If you're already in 1 Corinthians, go to the right a little bit. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. One of these things that we read verse 9, and verse 9 is one of these critical, amazing things in our Christology about who Jesus actually is. Colossians 2, 9. In him, that is Jesus, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. What's an amazing verse of truth, of who Jesus is. And, and this is going to separate us from the lies of a lot of the cults and a lot of the other religions. Who don't recognize that Jesus is the fullness of deity. But look at verse 10. And in him you have been made complete. You notice the past perfect there? Do you notice that this has already been accomplished? You're like, past perfect, that's English right I never even learned that. I don't like that stuff. Just, just understand it. In him you have been made complete. In him, the one in whom all the fullness of deity dwells. He has already done these things in your life. So be who you are. Be who you've been called to be, who you've been set apart to be, who you've been made to be already. This is 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. It's clear to see it in 2 Timothy, and it's just, I hope these verses bring hope, because in 2 Timothy, chapter 1, this is so clear, he has saved us, and he's called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. And his grace, which was already granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, and now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He's already done it. He's already made you these things. So be who you are. And you can hear that. And you can see here this morning go, be who I am. Okay. Hmm. How? You might ask me. Especially those who see the preacher's wife. Come on. All right. No, no, it's not Christmas time. How do we do this? How do we be who we are? We sing a song here. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Galatians 2.20. Yet not I, but Christ in me. Why? Because he's going to be who he already is. He just wants to be in you. And since he's already in you, and has already made you these things, be who you are. I gave you these verses in your notes so you can look at them. All throughout the book of Galatians, several times in Romans. First John, oh my goodness. John talks about being who you are. Second Corinthians, you notice it's all across all these different books in the New Testament. They're all talking about just being who you are. It's not trying to become something that you're not quite yet. Be who you are. Let's look at the pattern of 1 Thessalonians. We can do this quickly as we close. Because here is a book to a church, and throughout the book, even as Paul calls them to moral excellence, and Paul calls them to holiness, Paul throughout we recognize as being who we are. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. Walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. It's God who calls you to walk worthily. It's God who calls you to holiness. Chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in your love for one another. 
and for all men as we do. So that he may establish your hearts unblameable and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. He is going to do this in you and through you. Chapter 4, verse 1. Finally, brothers, we request and exhort you to the Lord. As you received instruction how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, but continue to excel, continue being who you are. Why? God has instructed you in this. God is the one who's showed you how to do this. God is the one who's telling you to do this. And later in that same chapter, verses 4, 7, and 8, excuse me, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, because God did not call you for the purpose of impurity, but God called you for the purpose of sanctification, being set apart, i.e. being holy. God called you for holiness, verse 8. Consequently, if you reject this, you're not rejecting man, it's not my rejection, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. His Holy Spirit is the one who's making you holy. He calls you to holiness, he's made you holy, and he's making you holy. He's the one who's doing all of this. Paul reminds me at the end of the book, just chapter 5, right at the end, 23 and 24. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. As he has already positionally made you holy, now he is making you holy all along. May he himself do it. So that your spirit and body be preserved and complete without blame in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will bring it to pass. God is the one who has made you holy, who has declared you to be holy, declared you to be righteous, and is now the one who desires to be making you holy and righteous. So that we can be ministers of truth and good character. God is gracious and compassionate, and he used Jonah even with his bad character. It was not the ideal. It was not the plan. There are ministers in this world today that God is gracious to them and uses them even though they're unfaithful. Even though they've gotten away with hurting some people, damaging some people. That's not God's plan. It's not God's desire. The New Testament makes that clear. Don't be that kind of minister. Don't employ that kind of ministry. Don't have that kind of ministry in your church. Don't have these teachers in your church. But sometimes they are. And the ones who know the truth, God still uses them despite your character flaws and weaknesses. And if you've been hurt by them, if, if they've shipwrecked your faith, maybe they're a bit like Jonah. I, I talk to had a great influence in my life this week. Dr. Marvin Mayer had been my mentor at Moody Bible Institute, met with me weekly in his office. I got to know Pam. She went and talked with Dr. Mayer, introduced herself and got to know him. She never had him for a class. His nickname was the Nightmare because his classes were hard. I took him for everything I could get. I had six classes with him. She avoided him with the play like most students did. Amazing godly man he poured into me over and over again and has continued to for the last 30 years. We still talk often. He came and preached my ordination service many years ago here in town. He lost his wife of 62 years recently after eight years of dementia. And he still prays the Lord at nine years old. We talked this week and I told him when I was writing Jonah and I was going through and he asked me, he said, do you think Jonah ever got it? And I said, no. Look at the way the book ends. He's angry with God. He's angry at God's compassion. He goes, but, but do you think Jonah ever got it? And I said, well, Dr. Mary, you told me to look at the text, and uh, I don't see the text where Jonah changed. Dan, who wrote the text? Oh, I think Jonah <laughs> What do you think that says? I'm not sure. Dr. Mary says, I think he gives us hope that he be changed. He recognized sometime later what he had been, what it was like. And he writes so freely, so honestly about his anger and his lack of compassion. I don't know where you're at this morning. 
where you would put yourself on a scale of your character. We will do our best as a church to continue to preach truth, the truth of God's word, as our foundation. And as God has revealed himself, we'll continue to pour that truth into our lives and yours. And we will aspire to be people of character. And we will aspire to help you be who you are. If you've been under the ministry of others, you haven't been that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the hurt that can cause. I'm sorry for the things that can bring. God is gracious, amazing in what he'll use and how he'll use us. But let us aspire to people who are not just used in our minimal begrudging obedience, but in holiness. Let's pray. God, we desire to be holy as you are holy, because you have, in your grace and mercy, purchased us, redeemed us, and you call us holy. You call us set apart. So Lord, have your own way in our lives. We've sung already this morning that you have in your way, and we'll see you again now. Change us and transform us by your grace. In your Son, Jesus Christ,